40 days through the gospel of Luke. Think, wait a minute, I thought it was 40 days through the gospel of John. Yeah, that's the second commentary, but guess what? As we finish Matthew, and we're almost done with Mark, Luke is a 40-day gospel as well, that we're going to break it up and share it over 40 days. And not only is it a 40 days through the gospel of Luke, it's 40 days through the gospel of Luke, your gospel, because Luke is your gospel. It is? Yeah, yeah. I didn't know that. Well, now you do. Why is it your gospel? Well, I'll tell you that in a little bit. But first, let's stand together and take your Bible in hand, and let's make this powerful declaration together. You ready? This is my Bible. It is the incomparable, inerrant, authoritative Word of God. I am what it says I am. I can do what it says I can do. I have what it says I have. I choose to live as it calls me to live. I am open and ready to receive from God's living Word. You may be seated, and as I get ready to launch into this first part, I first have to tell you about the guy that moved from Mississippi to Wisconsin. Why would he do that in the middle of winter? Some of you are already wondering that. Well, this guy loved to fish. In fact, he had a really big bass boat. And he just loved fish. He would fish every day when he was down in Mississippi. Well, they ended up having to move to Wisconsin. And it's like middle of January. And his wife says to him, honey, you got to get out of the house. You're driving me nuts. you got to get out of the house. You need to take up ice fishing. He says, I don't want to go ice fishing. He said, you love to fish. You fished every day when we're down in Mississippi. Yeah, but that, that's not ice. He said, no, you need to learn to go ice fishing. So he said, okay, I'll go ice fishing. So he's gone for about six hours. He comes back in, and he's just, okay, I went. His wife says, what, what, what's wrong? Did, well, did you catch anything? He said, no, I didn't catch anything. He said, by the time I cut a hole in the ice big enough to put my boat in, I was too tired to fish. <laughs> Part number one is our devotional check. Where are we at? Well, right now we have been reading through the New Testament together this year. And I've encouraged everyone to read it with us. I gave you the list. I want to, I want to know. I'm going to ask. I'm going to ask again in just a few weeks, so you, you want to get on track, make sure you are. How many of you are close, up-to-date, or close to up-to-date reading the New Testament through with us? Over half of you. Excellent. Probably 65% right now. Right, let's get the right. Come on. Get with us, because we don't want you to miss out. Today, you would be starting Mark chapter 15, which is a long chapter, so I actually cut it in half. I can do that, because I'm Mark. We cut Mark 15 in half. You start the first half of it today. You do the second half of it tomorrow. Then on, on Tuesday, you get to read Mark's account of the resurrection. And just like the rest of it is boom, boom, boom. Wow. Incredible. And then on Wednesday, you're going to start into your gospel. You get to read your gospel, the gospel of Luke. All right. I want you to know it's not too late to start today. Start today. We also have in the back of church, I have the handout there which has the breakdown of each day of the month, what verses, what chapter we're reading. So you can join in with us because I want everybody with us going through the New Testament together. And all throughout the year, I'm going to keep doing like I'm doing today. I'm going to help you understand what you're reading. I'm going to highlight the book and I'm going to have you just Get pulled into what the scriptures have for you. So as we launch into part number two, we're going to pull you into 40 days through your gospel. Your gospel. The gospel of Luke. Well, we better talk about that dude first of all. This guy, Luke. We've talked about him in the sense of there's Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, four gospels. And we looked together on February 6th. We talked about why do we have four Gospels? And we started to see it as we broke it down and realized with Matthew, first of all, Matthew is Jewish. He writes to the Jews, whose history included terrible captivity and most recently defiant servitude to Rome. Well, Matthew, who is a Jew, writes to the Jewish people in their Jewish language about the Jewish Messiah fulfilling Jewish scripture to complete Judaism and bring salvation to the Jews. 
Are there any Jewish people here today? Well, see, Matthew may not be your... Now, that doesn't mean it, it's not a good gospel to read. It is. But you have to understand a little bit of Judaism in order to understand the gospel of Matthew, which is why also you have 100 days from Matthew, Mark, and Luke, so you can understand this Jewish gospel. Well, the second gospel that we have, we talked about this book of Mark, this gospel of Mark, because Mark is writing to the Roman church, which is comprised of both Jews and Gentiles. It's like this mixed congregation. But culturally, they saw themselves as kind of, we are the elite victors. We are from Rome. And they were part of that fast-paced Roman Empire. And things move fast in Rome, except on the highway. On the highway, there's six million people in Rome, and all six million cars go on the road at the same time, and nobody gets anywhere. <laughs> I remember when we were staying with Guido Trentini in his home, and I said, Guido, did you grow up here in Rome? And he proudly put his chest out and said, I am a Roman. And, and, and that wasn't just something new today. That is the way they felt. We're part of the elite victors, the Roman Empire. Well, when Mark writes his gospel, he writes a fast-paced narrative to this mixed Roman audience, and he reveals Jesus as the conquering leader for the Roman world to find salvation in and to follow. But now we get to Luke. Luke is a, a Greek He's not Jewish. He's Greek. He's not of the Jewish religion. He's, he's a Gentile. He writes for the non-Jewish man whose name is Theophilus. His name means friend of God. This gospel is for non-Jewish people that they refer to as Greeks, but it includes all Gentiles because you can use Greek or Gentile interchangeably. Do we have any non-Jewish people here? Oh, guess what? That's your gospel. That was written for you so you could understand. Because Greece was conquered militarily by Rome, but they saw themselves as conquering Rome philosophically. And Luke paves the way to take the gospel message beyond Israel to the whole world, including you, you. The Gospel of Luke is your gospel. So let's look at this friend of yours, this friend Luke that wrote this gospel for you. Just four quick things about Luke so you get to know him a little bit better. Well, Luke is the author both of this gospel, the Gospel of Luke, and the book of Acts. He wrote both of those books, and he's mentioned three times in the New Testament. The first time he's mentioned is in Colossians chapter 4 and verse 14. Paul calls him Luke, the beloved physician. This guy has really good bedtime man, bedside manner. He read How to Win Friends and Influence People. He just really, he was just really good with he was a beloved physician. He like got along with everybody. He connected well with people. He was the beloved physician. Not only was he that beloved physician, but when Paul is at the end of his life, in 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 11, he's about to be put to death. Paul says, only Luke is with me. He's the only one who stuck around. He was the only one. Wouldn't you like a friend like that? A friend who, no matter what you're going through, I'm with you. I'm sticking it out with you. I'll be there till the end. That's the kind of man Luke was. He'd make a good friend, wouldn't he? And in Philemon, verse 24, because there's only one chapter, Paul lists Luke as one of his fellow laborers. So now you know a little bit about your friend, Luke. Let's talk about Luke's other friends besides you, because we do have some other friends or sources that helped him to be able to put that gospel together for you, because Luke was a Gentile. Luke wasn't there following the ministry of Jesus. So how did he write everything that he wrote? How did he know everything in all of the intricate details? Well, Matthew was a friend of his. Matthew was one of the 12, and of course he personally witnessed the gospel so he could write his own gospel to the Jewish people. When we look at the gospel of Mark, Mark's gospel drew very heavily on Peter as a source. 
And Peter was, of course, one of those in Jerusalem who Luke also had time with. In fact, Luke was a companion also of Paul. We see that he reflects a lot of Paul. In fact, there are 200 literary similarities between Luke and Paul. Why? Because Paul's primary language would have been Hebrew Aramaic. Spoke a little Greek because if you live in Miami, Florida, you've got to learn a little Spanish. You're going to live in Montreal, Canada. You better learn a little French. And Paul had to learn a little Greek, but then he got to hang out with Luke, who taught him fluently to speak articulately. So there's a lot of similarities, and we see that they did hang out together because in Acts chapter number 16 and verse 10, it changes. Luke switches to using the first person plural, we went out together. And he tells us that he joined up with the Apostle Paul. Some of his other sources, he was a Luke, he, Luke was a disciple of the other apostles. He spent time with them. He drew from their accounts. And so very, very importantly, he knew Mary, the mother of Jesus. And she was the source for so much of, well, the first three chapters. That's how he learned about how the angel came and spoke to her and how her cousin Elizabeth and Zacharias and all that transpired there and for the, those shepherds out in the field, Mary was able to share all the details and let Luke know so he could make a good orderly account for you. So let's talk about that orderly account. Now Matthew has the most chapters, but Luke is still the longest gospel. How can that be? Matthew's 28 chapters, Luke is 24. Yeah, but Luke has more verses in, a lot more verses. And not only is it the longest gospel, his style of writing is incredibly refined. He uses 700 Greek words not found in the rest of the New Testament, which makes it, when I read it in Greek, it's like, I don't recognize that word. I got to go look that up in the thesaurus. That's not a word that I use every day. He's really refined also throwing in medical terminology left and right because he was a physician. So when he describes the healings of Jesus, he does it complete with medical terminology. Luke is also a gospel specifically for you, the Gentiles. Why? Because you need to hear the gospel story too. And he makes sure that he connects it to your life. When Matthew shared his account for the Jewish people, what does he trace it back to? He traces it back to King David and Abraham, the father of the Jewish nation. Well, I don't go back to Abraham other than through faith. So Luke takes his account and he brings it all the way back to Adam because every single one of us is a child of Adam and Eve. Not only does he bring us that, but he then takes, when he brings us the genealogy, he brings it through Mary and not through Joseph. Mary was his source. And he brings us Mary's genealogy. All right? The Gospel of Luke is also incredibly well organized. It's written with specific intention. He said the primary purpose of his Gospel would have given accurate, as he said, quote, unquote, orderly account. He made sure things were really well done so that you Gentile, non-Jewish believers would be able to know about this Jesus that you're going to serve. So you could know. Now he had a secondary purpose. He wanted you to really learn well, so he teaches us a lot. In fact, he includes 10 parables that are distinctive to his gospel that the others don't share. And then he also brings a bunch of teachings that Jesus gave to complement the others, but teachings that relate and hit home for what? Gentiles, for you, so that you can know Jesus and what Jesus wants to do in your life. And thirdly, Luke also attacks prejudice. He is really, boom, hitting prejudice hard. He hits prejudice in every form, including socioeconomics. Why would he do that? Well, first of all, if you understand physicians at the time of the Roman Empire, in order for a large family or community to have a physician, 
they would have to have somebody who was, of course, incredibly intelligent and willing to learn and put themselves through the rigors of med school and to apprentice and train. They would oftentimes take a slave, a slave who was really smart, really showed incredible promise and made the deal. You're willing to go through med school. You're willing to train day and night for years. After you serve us so many years, you will be a free man. And that's very likely that Luke fit just into that, that drama. That meant he knows to be a slave, the lowest of lows, to being a physician, a free man, up in the top of his socioeconomic rows. He knew what it was like to be in and out of favor. He knew what it was like to be blessed and to be a slave. So when Luke writes, he writes with a lot of strength against any kind of prejudice, and especially towards Gentiles, towards you. You see, if you're anti-Jewish, they call that anti-Semitic, and that's a very bad prejudice because God loves the Jewish people. But if you are anti-Gentile, which I have met some Jewish people that were anti-Gentile, that is just as much sin. You are not to be prejudiced about anything. And he rebukes strongly and shares Jesus' strong teachings about loving the Gentiles, going to the Gentiles, caring for the Gentiles, and how Jesus ministered to them. So he's against prejudice, prejudice against you, prejudice against Gentiles, and really strong and prejudiced against women. You see, during that time, in that culture, they were very anti-woman. Women not only did not vote, women couldn't hold property, women were property. Women were controlled and oftentimes abused and when Luke writes, he writes so strongly to show us not only were there 12 apostles and there were 70 others who went out as apostles as well and did ministry, but there were this other group. It was the women. And he brings up the women who financially supported and kept Jesus' ministry afloat. He uses the Greek word gyna, which is the word for woman, he uses it almost as much as Matthew and Mark put together. Luke uses it 43 times. Matthew and Mark combined use it 49. Why does Luke use it so much? Because he honors women. He's constantly showing us how this woman was such an important part of Jesus' ministry, how she financially supported it. These women were caring for Jesus and the others, helping get things, because you know, if anything gets done, you better have some women there, Right? And all the guys should say, amen. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> you should say, if you want to go home happy, you say, amen. amen. <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> Luke shows how Jesus had a totally different attitude towards women. And compared to the Jewish and the pagan attitudes that viewed women with contempt, Jesus viewed women, ready for this, as the creation of God. Why? Because he's the one who created them. So when you get into your gospel of Luke, you're going to see how much he was so gracious towards the women who were part of Jesus' life and ministry. So let's talk about part three here. I'm going to pull things together because you're at the end of the gospel of Mark now. You're into the chapter which is taking you into the crucifixion of Christ. And then on Tuesday, you get to, boom, he experienced the resurrection with Mark. But Luke is coming up on Wednesday. So let's put these pieces together in the cross of Mark and Luke and you, because I want you included in it as well. Let's talk about the cross and Mark. Who does Mark write to? The Romans, right? Yeah, he's writing to the Romans. You're currently reading about what he's writing to these Roman people. But this proud Roman audience 
is about to hear how Jesus died at the hands of Roman soldiers through a form of capital punishment that the Romans made infamous. And it's like, yeah, whoa. We did that? We, 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 we did that? Yeah. We all did that. But even death couldn't hold them. <laughs> right? And it's like, wow. Death couldn't hold even someone who was killed by crucifixion. It's like, they read that and it's like, wow. And they're humbled. That Roman church gets humbled because it was a Roman cross that they have to read about that they used to crucify Jesus. But not only are they humbled by that cross, they're also healed by that same cross. That's Mark chapter 15. Let's put the cross together with Mark and Luke because we're about to launch into Luke. But first, let's look at how Mark shares it in chapter number 8. Go to Mark chapter number 8. I want you to turn there because we're going to see, and I want you to compare this, and you, you might even want to make a note when we get into Mark chapter 8 and verse 34 to put next to Mark 8, 34, the next passage that I'm going to share with you from Luke chapter number 9. So Mark chapter number 8 and verse 34. Now when Jesus went around teaching, there were no tape recorders, there was no CDs, they did not have MP3 players. There were no videotaping. The iPhones were like really slow back then, okay? <laughs> they didn't have recording devices, so what did they do? Jesus went from town to town to city to village, to this community, and that. And he would share the same teaching, but he would speak it and adapt it to the place that he went to. And here, when we read this in Mark, it's different from the one, the account we read in Luke. But Jesus is sharing a very similar thing. Mark chapter number 8, starting at verse 34, when he called the people to himself with his disciples also, he said to them, Whoever desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake in the Gospels will save it. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul, the people listen to that, it's like, what would you cope? Time out, time out, time out. You see, you and I, we think of a cross and we think, oh, that, that's a cross necklace, it's really pretty. Or you have a shirt that has a cross on and it's just like, well done, and maybe it, maybe it even has some cool wording on or something. We think of crosses as jewelry and beautiful and and. They didn't think of it that way. The cross was where you torture somebody. The cross is the worst form of capital punishment ever heinously invented by man. The cross is horrible. They reused crosses over and over again. There were layers of blood on the cross. And not only layers of blood, but I don't, I'm just going to speak frankly with you, okay? When somebody dies, the sphincter muscles relax in their body. They urinate, and the feces comes out. So the crosses smelled like pee and crap. They stunk. They were horrible, ugly, stained, and stinky. And Jesus said, I want you to pick up your stained, stinky Blood stained. I want you to. I want you to pick that up. I want you to follow me. People, whoa! You, 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 you just said pick up my cross, my and and follow you. If I really want to, if I want to, if I want to follow you, I got to pick up my cross. 
Now I want you to turn over to Luke chapter number 9. Luke chapter 9, and we're going to pull up verse 23. In Luke chapter 9, starting at verse number 23, Jesus is already speaking, and he continues on in verse 23. Then he said to them all, If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. For what what profit is it to a man if he gains the whole world and is himself destroyed or lost? Don't just pick up your cross. Pick up your cross daily. Now people are that stinky, blood-stained, urine-soaked, feces-covered cross. I'm supposed to pick that up every day? What, what does that mean to take up my cross every day? be somewhat nebulous, but let's take the context, because the context is pretty clear. If you want to be his disciple, you need to identify with Jesus, because Jesus has been telling them over and over and over again, I'm going to go to Jerusalem. When we get there, you need to understand, the chief priests and the elders are going to turn me over to the Romans, and I'm going to be crucified, and on the third day, I'm going to rise again. It's like the disciples, no way, not going to happen. We don't want to hear, no, la, 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 la. They weren't wanting to hear it. Why? Because their entire lives, they were raised to believe when Messiah comes, he's going to be a tough dude. He's going to be like Judas Maccabeus. He's going to be the hammer. He's going to bring the hammer down on the Roman Empire and free us from the tyranny of Rome. You just tell me, you're not getting it. David's son, what kind of son is he? He's not a military leader. David calls him Lord because he's a spiritual leader. Jesus is telling them, I haven't come to free you from the tyranny of Rome. I came to free you from a much bigger tyranny. Come to free you from the tyranny of yourself. Because if you haven't figured it out yet, you can live in a free country. And while we're blessed to live in a free country, you can still be in bondage. You can have habits that you can be in bondage to. You can have substances that you can be in bondage to. You can be free on the outside, but you can be in bondage on the inside. Jesus doesn't want you to just be free in a country that has freedom. He wants you to be free on the inside. You can be in jail in the maximum security prison and you can be free while you're in jail. How can that be? Because the biggest prison isn't the prison they can lock you in. It's the prison of your own heart and the prison of your own mind. The tyranny of yourself. Jesus calls us to freedom. You want to be his disciple, you got to start, you got to identify with Jesus. You say, okay. Jesus said, uh, they're going to crucify me. I'm going to identify with him. I'm going to pick up my cross. I'm going to follow him. Thomas put it this way when Jesus said, let's go, let's go. We got to go over to Bethany. Got to raise up Lazarus. Thomas said, let's also go. That we may die with him. Jesus said, you pick up your cross. You come and you follow me. Jesus said, if you save your life, you're going to lose it. You want to live it your way and find your life your way, you're going to lose it. But if you will lose your life for me, you're going to find it. I grew up in 19... <laughs> and back then it's like, wow, I'm going to go find myself, man. It's like, oh, did you get lost? 
oh, you know, I gotta find out like who I am and you know, find myself. Yeah. Well, the 60s, as people were trying to find themselves, led into the 70s where uh, Carl Rogers at the University of Madison came up with the groundbreaking popular psychology of Rogerian client-centered non-directive psychotherapy. And this type of psychotherapy, one of the postulated high, uh, foundations of it, I guess you could say, is you are the center of your universe. You are your own God. No one has the right to tell you anything of what you should do, who you are, or what you should be, or how you should live. Only you, because you, as your own God, in the center of your universe, you have all that you need within yourself already. You think you're going to save your life that way? You're just going to get more and more lost and more and more confused. But if you will lose it for Jesus, you will find what you were created for. You will find the meaning and purpose of your life. And you will find that your life is not just some cosmic accident of some poo and some goo that made you. You find out you are a divine creation of the creator himself. That you are a treasure of God. But you need to deny yourself. How can I have him make my life if I deny my life? Because you need to make you off of the throne of your heart. And you need to have Jesus be on the throne of your heart. You need to have Jesus calling the shots and Jesus be the Lord of your life, not you. You have to say, okay, I surrender. I'm not going to be doing it my way. I'm going to do it your way instead, Lord. Because that's what the cross really represents. It's absolute surrender to Father's will. When Jesus said, not my will, but your will be done. As he went to the cross, he was saying, I'll do Father's will instead of mine. And there's no room for self-centered living. We must be Christ-centered in our living. We need to surrender and say, I want your will for my life. Following him means every single day, daily, living by his word and the commandments rather than our feelings and impulses because your feelings are a lousy barometer. Your impulses will lead you to hell. Instead of following what your feelings and impulses are, you and I need to follow what God has called us to do and to live as he has called us to live. That's picking up your cross daily. You need to take up your cross daily in real sanctification. What is that? Setting yourself apart from God, for God. Getting rid of the garbage habits of your life and saying, I'm going to live my life to the pleasure of God instead. You need to crucify. Take that cross and crucify your old nature. Spirit, soul, and body, you need to clean up your life. Not to get saved, but because you are saved. Because when you give your life to Christ, he forgives the past, but then he says, okay, now you, not, you need to forget your past way of living. It's time to change. It's time to sanctify and clean it up. Take up your cross daily and follow him. In closing, put a couple of these pieces together for you. What, the ice fisherman? I kind of said we were going to come back to that, right? That ice fisherman, he, he was doing it the wrong way, wasn't he? He was doing it the hard way. You don't cut the hole to put the boat in. You cut a hole in the ice, and then you go in, push your shanty over, or have your shanty over the top, turn on your color TV, and kick your feet up there, open your refrigerator, and just grab yourself, you know, a good A&W root beer, and you just kick back, and you say, okay, when the pop-ups go, we'll look for the fish. In the meantime... Oh, yeah, yeah. What's on TV? <laughs> you can do it the hard way or you can do it the easy way. The hard way is trying to earn your salvation. The hard way is trying to do it through your works. You have to realize that Jesus already did the work, and what you need to do is you need to surrender your life to him. You need to come to him the way that you are and do it his way. You don't clean up your life to come to God you clean up your life because you belong to God. 
you come just the way that you are to God. And then you pick up your cross daily to remind yourself that when you mess up, and you will mess up. It, did I say you will mess up? Hello? You will mess up. That's reality. Of course you're going to screw up. Of course you're going to mess up. You're going to do stupid things and make mistakes. And sometimes you're going to say, just like the Apostle Paul in Romans 7, I can't believe I did that again. But you take it to the cross. You say, Jesus, I'm sorry. I know you paid for this. I thank you for your forgiveness. And please help me do better. I'm going to put my focus on you and not on my failure. And I'll move forward by faith. Jesus paid it already. You need to receive the forgiveness that he gives. And there's a difference between your cross that you carry and Jesus' cross. Because although you carry your cross, you only experience the shadow of death because he took the real thing head on. He not only carried it, he died on it. And he did that for you. Stand with me as we close in prayer. This is our moment. Our moment to say, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pick up the cross and I'm going to follow Jesus the best I can for the rest of my life. I am absolute, I've decided to follow Jesus. Bow your heads, please, and close your eyes. And in this holy moment, Holy Father, we're asking you in the power of your Holy Spirit to speak into our lives what we need in conviction for consecration. Thank you, Holy Spirit. My dear ones, today, if with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, and those of you at home too, I want you to respond. Those of you in the Algoma campus, I want you to respond. Those of you, others listening, please be sensitive right now. Respond to the Holy Spirit. If you know, you know what, I need to give my heart to Jesus. Maybe you've never made Jesus the Savior of your life, and you know I need, I need to get Jesus as the Lord of my life. Or maybe you have accepted Christ, but you have not been living daily picking up your cross to follow him. And you say, I need to consecrate my life and dedicate my life to Christ. Just slip your hand up right now and say, I'm going to do that. I'm going to consecrate my life for Christ. I'm going to dedicate my life to Jesus today. Awesome. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. And I want us all to pray together and pray this prayer of consecration. Out loud, would you just say, Dear Jesus, you left heaven, came to this earth, to carry the cross and to die on it in my place for my sin. I deserved it, but you took it because you love me. And I love you too now. And I am sorry for my sin. I want to follow you. I repent. Forgive me and help me follow you. I'm picking up my cross. I'm going to do things your way. Instead of living for myself, I'm going to live for you. Instead of me on the throne, I'm putting you on the throne of my heart. I want you as Lord of my life. So I surrender to you. You are my Lord. And I'm going to serve you and remember your love, receive your forgiveness, walk in your ways, and enjoy eternity with you because of your goodness to me. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, dear ones, for being here today and sharing these moments together. Those of you online, thank you for joining this wonderful group here in the sanctuary, your brothers and sisters, and enjoying it. Those that are staying for the annual business meeting is going to be at noon today. I love you. God bless you. Have an awesome Sunday. We'll see you next week.